Hello, it's Punk. This is not the kind of video I normally make, and there may be more like it at some point, maybe not, I don't know. I'll be talking about wraiths from Madoka Magica and Madoka Magica Wraith Arc in this video. If you haven't seen the show, but you'd like to, or you haven't read the manga and would like to, I suggest doing so. If you're still here, or are coming back to this video, let's get on to our main topic. For anyone who's watched Milka Magica, you should know at least of the existence of wraiths within the universe created as a byproduct of Kaname and Vidoka's wish. Though, if you've only watched the show in Rebellion, you may not have a good idea of what exactly wraiths are. For the sake of clarity, I'll be referring to wraiths as wraiths, not some of the other names given to them from the original fan translations and the end of the Madoka manga, where they are referred to as demons, and in the manga's case, quote, magical beasts, end quote. For anyone who's ignored the spoiler warning, wraiths came into existence after a girl known as Kaname Madoka wished to, to erase all witches before they are born, all witches in all universes, born past and future, with my own hands, end quote. Before her wish, magical girls were destined to fight and eventually turn into witches. But after Madoka made her wish, became a goddess, and enacted her wish of destroying all witches, they, of course, were no more. In their place, instead, are now wraiths. In a nutshell, wraiths are physical manifestations of the curses and negative energy generated by humanity's mere existence. They are the enemy to all magical girls, and are locked in a constant and eternal war with them. In more details though, a lot can be gathered about wraiths from examining them in Wraith Arc, and from looking into the, you know, hidden meanings behind each one of them. There are four main kinds of wraiths. The standard wraith, acolyte wraith, enlightened wraith, and Deliverance Wraith. Though in the Japanese version of Wraith Arc, the three besides the regular Wraith are called the Shugen Wraith, Satori Wraith, and Moksha Wraith, which are all important figures or terminology within many Eastern faiths, such as Buddhism or Hinduism. I'll be doing an analysis on both versions of the names for them when talking about the specific Wraiths. All of these Wraiths, when defeated, drop grief cubes, which act as a replacement for grief seeds, allowing for magical girls to purify their soul and fight off entropy. Now onto the actual wraiths themselves. First off being, of course, your standard wraith. From my understanding, they're called this in both releases, so I'll just be examining the meaning behind the word wraith. The word wraith can have a few different meanings. One of them being a ghost or a ghost-like image of someone, especially one seen shortly before or after their death. They appear in large numbers wherever lots of humans live, and they are also shown briefly in episode 12. They look like partially decaying monks wearing long robes, with small amounts of blocky particles floating off of their body. I'll be talking more about what I believe that to be, later. The basic wraiths on, in a one-on-one -on -one fight prove little more than child's play to a magical girl, easily being slain by newly contracted girls. The only real threat that can actually be gathered from these wraiths is their large numbers. There are plenty of these bastards around, which makes plenty of work for magical girls. So. I guess it's a win for them. Their presence generates miasma in the air, which usually alerts magical girls to their presence. The more wraiths in an area, the thicker the miasma. Power-wise, wraiths have the ability to feed on the memory and personality traits of humans, leaving them as essentially lobotomized husks of who they once were. If you could consider your loss of personality, memories, and emotion even as death, then you could say these wraiths to most people are something they would indeed see shortly before they die. 
A few more uses of the word wraith would be literary-wise, a wisp or faint trace of something or someone. And when you pair that up with how it could be used to refer to a insubstantial person or thing, someone who just goes through the motions without any actual drive or emotion, it sums up what wraiths do to people pretty well, in my opinion at least. An example of the effects of a wraith attack are pretty evident with how Kyoko taunts Sayaka, saying she should let Hitomi have her feelings devoured by a wraith so that Sayaka could pursue her feelings for Kiyosuke. The ability that wraiths possess also applies to being able to affect the soul gems of magical girls, even their magic, as seen when wraiths try to steal Homura's feelings from Madoka and her memories of her even. So, TLDR for regular race. They grow like weeds, and in hordes. To get into the next race, I want to talk a little bit about the names for it, in both the English and Japanese. The definition of the original English name for this race, Acolyte, is the person assisting this celebrant in a religious service or procession. A little bit of info just from the name alone gives us a bit of insight into this Wraith's position and the rest of Wraith society of, of, of sorts, if you could even call it that, or at least the ones we see within the manga. But they usually help organize the lower ranking Wraiths. It's possible that they even see their war against human emotions and magical girls as a event, religious or possibly non-religious. I, I lean a bit more towards religious though, since they, they use the term acolyte, um, but that's just my opinion on it. In Japanese, they're referred to as a shujin wraith, which has a connection to a specific kind of Buddhist belief, mixed with a lot of Shinto folk beliefs. The mix of the two, called shujindo, though it can be taken as way of trial and practice, or way of the shugen. This wraith in particular, having a strong connection to fire and flame, makes me think of the figure Akala. He's known by many names, the Immovable Lord or Fudo Mu. A quotation from a passage of the Ma'evero Kana Tantra about Akala reads as follows Below the Mantra Lord, in the direction of Naridi, is Akala the Tadagara's servant. He holds a wisdom sword and a noose. The hair from the top of his head hangs down on his left shoulder, and with one eye he looks fixedly, awesomely wrathful. His body is enveloped in fierce flames, and he rests on a rock. Now, if we look at the Acolyte Wraith, it's always in a sitting position. Its body is engulfed in flames, and it has the ability to summon four bronze swords. I think that's pretty cool. Physically speaking, however, they appear similar to regular wraiths, though much larger, and their torso and arms look much stronger than a normal wraith, who looks malnourished in comparison. In a fight, a amateur magical girl may be able to take on an acolyte wraith, as seen by Saika taking on a Acolyte Wraith single-handedly in Wraith Arc Volume 1. If you ask me what I think of it, I consider Acolyte Wraiths to basically act as your standard sort of mini-boss, leader of a small group sort of, sort of guy, you know? On top of the previous physical differences between the regular Wraith and the Acolyte Wraith, there's an increase in the blocky particles floating around the wraith. As the further along we get with the wraith, the less human-like they appear and the more they begin to look like a mess of shapes, which I believe is a metaphor for enlightenment, which you'll, you'll see why later I believe that, I think. And the only reason I bring up enlightenment now is because of the next wraith we'll be talking about, the enlightened wraith. Like the previous two wraiths, I want to delve into the meaning behind the wraith's name. 
both English and Japanese. The English term enlightened is mostly a Western translation of Buddhist terms. A more literal translation would be awakened, which in this context would be used to refer to someone who has achieved great insight and knowledge and continued to reject disturbing emotions and desires, or literally blowing them out in this case as it tries to completely destroy them. Considering how a large part of Madoka Magica involves characters pursuing their emotions and desires, it's clear that the wraiths are an exact opposite to the force that power magical girls. As magical girls are powered by their emotions and desires, while wraiths are powered by the continued drive to snuff out emotional energy. The Japanese name of the enlightened wraith, the Satori wraith, comes from a Japanese Buddhist term for awakening. So the majority of what I just stated also applies to it. However, we can gain some more insight from the idea itself, as the term Satori is often used hand in hand with Kensho. Kensho refers to the Buddhist principle of emptiness, which I, I think emptiness works pretty well for wraiths, considering you know that's how the majority of victims of wraith attacks are, are left. Okay, now picture this. You and possibly a few other magical girls are doing your thing, fighting wraiths, you know? When out of nowhere, the ground below you begins to erode and give way to cracks and holes. Any power nearby goes out, and any metal nearby instantly begins to rust. And then you see it, the hulking mass that is an enlightened wraith. Barely anything about it at this point is recognizable as vaguely humanoid. It's almost entirely a colossal mass of shapes and particles. By yourself, you're mostly 10 feet underground at this point. If you and your team are able to successfully defeat an enlightened wraith, well, one of your buddies might have just kicked the bucket at this point, or at least gotten seriously fucked up. The enlightened wraith is not a power to be messed with in any way. First off, there's the enlightenment process I, I brought up earlier. The more powerful the wraith is, the less humanoid they appear. Once again, reflecting the idea that they're transcending its humanoid body and becoming more powerful through that method of doing so. It's possible that the more a wraith drains people of their emotional energy, the stronger it becomes and has the, the chance to evolve to one of the more dangerous types of wraith. Similar in regards to the familiars of the previous world having the ability to turn into a witch after they kill enough people. Or at least it just reminds me of that. However, though tangents aside, combat-wise, they fight using large, blocky particles to try to crush its foes. The air around them make you shiver, and makes your skin crack and rough. So all in all, an unpleasant experience. The amplified power of the Lightened Wraith is something that seems to be quite recognized by more experienced magical girls. Such as, during part of Volume 1, Kyoko realized that Sayaka was trying to fight an Enlightened Wraith on her own, grabbed her, and ran the fuck out of there. She recognized how much danger going up against it would put them in, even with the two of them there to fight it. The Enlightened Wraith is only trumped by one final Wraith though, the biggest of all the Wraiths, the Deliverance Wraith. At this point, the wraith no longer has any humanoid features. Its power is through the roof, as a single deliverance wraith is enough to put Homura out of commission. This is the last known stage of a wraith. It's possible there are ones stronger than it, but none of them are in the manga, so for Madoka's sake, we're going to consider them as the strongest. Everything around a deliverance wraith is subject to freezing cold temperatures. Think similarly to White Album from Jojo Part 5, but on a much grander scale. Just from this bit alone, there could be multiple different meanings derived from it. Oftentimes, someone with a lack of emotions is described as cold. These kinds of wraiths are easily capable of leaving someone with no emotions 
personality or emotions whatsoever, turning someone into cold husks with its original name, they're called the Moksha Wraith. Moksha is a term found heavily with Buddhism and Hinduism. From my understanding, Moksha is the highest state of enlightenment a human can reach while still alive. It's the closest to the state of Nirvana, which can only be achieved after one's death. With the insights provided by its name, it's quite clear this wraith will be what sends the majority of magical girls along the Law of Cycles. Now going back to the official translation name, Deliverance, the definition of Deliverance is the act of being rescued or set free. Keep in mind, a lot of magical girls will consider, you know, their existence as a magical girl a something they want to be saved from. To briefly bring up Magia Records, I know it's, it's, a, it's a sin. A large group from the anime, at least, I haven't played the game view being a magical girl as something they wish to be saved from, something that they, they they don't want to be, they feel tricked by Kyubei into becoming it. And I imagine that magical girls would still feel the same way, even in the universe created by Madoka Kaname, considering that Kyubei is still doing his own thing, the only thing that she really changed is that they don't turn into witches. They still struggle, they still, you know, have to endure a lot of the same hardships experienced by magical girls in the original timeline, just now without the worry of having to become a witch. Tangent aside though, Deliverance and Moksha both connect highly with the process of enlightenment and shedding their more humanoid forms, which in my opinion is confirmed by how every previous form of Wraith has been at least containing some vaguely humanoid features. But the stronger they became, the less humanoid overall they became. While the Deliverance Wraith is freed from those shackles to being a being of pure energy and power. On top of that, it serves another purpose of delivering mortal beings and magical girls from the dangers of emotions and desires, specifically for, magical, for a magical girl. If Magical Girl loses her ability to do magic from, because of a wraith, she still has her soul gem. She still has to take care of it. And if she doesn't, it will eventually darken and she will be taken away by the Law of the Cycles. Which is a sort of form of deliverance from the duty of being a Magical Girl, if you look at it like that. Now, on to my closing remarks. From the Normal Wraith, to the Acolyte, to the Enlightened Wraith, and the Deliverance Wraith, they all serve one purpose, one goal. To put it in the words of Wraith Madoka, you mustn't underestimate the emotional energy of humans. If we Wraiths let the emotional energy alone, the world and the heavens may flip around. And she's kind of right. M but much like Huey's race, Wraiths view emotional energy as something dangerous. It's possible they even know about what Goddess Madoka did. Rewriting the entire universe to follow the whims of a wish powered by her emotions. Emotions are something that put the entire universe at danger, possibly of, possibly of being rewritten again and again and again. Which could be argued they're, they're right. So Wraiths take that emotional energy and turn it into grief cubes. Unlike witches, which are born from curses of emotional energy of a single girl, race collect the emotional energy of everyone and everything within the new universe created by Madoka. I think this could possibly be why, when a deliverance wraith tries to take some of Homer's emotions and passions, they're not able to turn them into grief cubes because they are emotions and passions born from the original, original universe thus are different forms of energy that they do not understand. However, to me, that's a topic for another time. Thank you for watching. If you liked this video, um, please let me know. I This is the first time I've done anything like this. Hopefully I don't have like many mistakes in it. It was a lot of fun to make, um, and I'm, I'm excited to see feedback on it. Uh, maybe subscribe if you want to. I would really appreciate it. Um, though, 
you, you don't have to. I, if you haven't seen, I make Madoka Magica animations. Um, I, I just made one where I, I, I animated some of the English dub bloopers. So maybe take a look at that if you want to. Though you don't have to, of course. Um, anyway, so I, I hope you folks have a good day. Uh, thank you for watching, and bye!